with your hosts Don Abernathy and Jeff Copsetta. Welcome everybody to another episode of the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast, your favorite World War II based podcast. The new, <laughs> my sorry, my live stream's on. The renewed vigor and excitement. What's the Scuttlebutt podcast? I got to admit to everybody, you know, during 2020, the fact that all everything was shut down, all the events were canceled minus one or two, and just being in the doldrums of that, that was 2020, you know, just kind of killed the motivation for everything. But now that I've been to a great event this weekend and um, been in contact with some of our listeners and just seeing the renewed enjoyment that is the hobby of World War II reenacting, I am just excited and ready to go. How are you doing, Jeff? Well, I think you've proved that anticipation heightens the pleasure. Uh, yeah, never get complacent, stay frosty, and then that won't happen. Yeah, I'm doing great. Um, just survived like one of the worst hailstorms that we've ever had in this part of the country. So that was lovely. But other than that, uh, I think we got some cool things to talk about. I know you do. Did and you I've su- got some things to talk about tonight, so it's going to be good. Did you sustain any damage during all that? So just a little bit. Uh, my parents are getting a new roof. Their travel trailers totaled. Wow. Uh, $8,000 worth of damage to my truck. Jeez. Uh, Waiting to hear about Tammy's Durango. Yeah, all kinds of damage to our plants and yeah. That's my biggest fear with hurricanes. I've been lucky. I've never had any extreme hurricane damage. And of course, we're Americans. Let's be honest. We all have crap in our garage, so no one has room for in their garage for your vehicles. Unless you have multiple vehicles and only a two-car garage. I might be able to fit my Jetta in there. I remember a couple years ago during one of the hurricanes, I was able to fit my Tacoma in there. We left the... The bullet's waiting outside because it's a lease. Who cares? <laughs> but uh, now my Tundra wouldn't fit in there if I wanted it to. I remember the first hurricane I dealt with back was Hurricane Charlie when it first moved down here. And I was driving a sweet 1998 Pontiac Firebird four-cylinder automatic <laughs> that my dad got for my stepmom when I was in high school. And she couldn't drive a stick or did, preferred not to. And so he got her a, a V6 automatic 1996 Pontiac Firebird Coupe, but in the 2003s, early 2000s, I was rocking a 1995 Ford Escort LX. And so my dad came with me with a prestigious offer to purchase his 1996 Pontiac Firebird Coupe and trade in my luxurious ride of the 1995 Ford Escort LX. Hmm, not much of a competition and or challenge there, so I kicked the the Escort that didn't have air conditioning on it to the curb because we just been down to Florida. Started rocking the Firebird, which it was kind of cool because, you know, here I am, 23, 24, and I actually have something that we had in high school. Here's something that sat in the garage in my house in high school. Now, you know, that was Ohio. As soon as I graduated, my dad, a couple of years later, moved to Texas, then moved to California. So this car went from Ohio to Texas to California and then back to Florida. Pretty much everything I had from our childhood was gone. And I ran that thing to the ground. It basically got a hundred and 50,000 miles on it, start having all kind of problems and kicked it to the curb. But uh, the reason I bring all that up is during Hurricane Charlie, it did get minor scratches and abrasions on the hood from flying uh, shingles. But that's like the worst damage I ever got on any of my cars, knock on wood, from a hurricane while living here in Florida. Yeah, you're, you're pretty lucky. I mean, I've been through some hailstorms and I've never had any damage. But man, we made up for it this time. It was just like the luck ran out. But it could be worse. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. I know you have access to uh, Jeeps, 1943 Fords, Willys, what have you. You ever pushed one? Oh, yeah. Of course you pushed one. (laughs) Have you ever pushed one 300 yards? Uh, It'd be a a close second to that. And and not only that, I had to push it up a ramp onto the trailer. I'm sorry, not 300 yards, 300 feet. 300 feet is 100 yards. Yeah, probably. You ever pushed it 6,000 feet? <laughs> yeah, that's like a mile. Actually, it is, um, that would be a mile point six seven. How would I know this? Well, tonight I achieved the ultimate in mixing my two passions in life, and that is World War II and ridiculous ass-kicking voluntary fitness. Um, not to get too mired down into it, because this is a World War II-based podcast, but... Um, as some of you know, who listen to my other podcast, I participate in savage races. These are obstacle course races. They kick your ass, yada, yada, yada. 
Well, right now in the month of April, I am participating in the Savage Race, Savage Anywhere virtual race. It's not even a race. It's an exercise routine. And they're major. You have 28 days to finish 14 of them. And they sound easy, but they're not. Like One of them is like, okay, yeah, you run a mile, take a break, run three miles. Big deal. One of them is a wreck where you put on a carrier plate with 30 pounds on it. You go out and do 50 air squats, run a mile, do on dirt, mind you, do 50 air squats, run a mile, and either do that for three miles or six miles. Anyhow, I won't bore you guys with all that. You can see all these routines on our YouTube channel. Well, one of the races that I put off or one of the exercise routines of the 14 I've been putting off is called out of gas. And the whole thing is it's supposed to be a sled push, but we're normal people. We're not CrossFitters. We're not professional athletes. We don't have weighted sleds to push around, right? And they thought, well, how can a normal person do a sled push? Well, let's reminisce to back in the old days when when we had cars like a 1995 Ford Escort or a 1996 Pontiac Firebird Coupe that didn't have the computer to tell you how many miles you had left before you ran out of gas. Didn't have the, all the beeps, the whistles, the roadside assistance. And the whole thing was is back in the day, we ran out of gas. And you would hope you ran out of gas somewhere close to the gas station so you could push your car. So the routine tonight for the sled push is to get yourself a car and someone to maneuver it while it's in neutral and push it 100 yards, wait a minute, push it back, do this 20 times. And now I've been putting all these in my YouTube channel. Of course, you know, my neighbors already know I'm crazy. They see me carrying a 76-pound bucket down the street, you know, preparing for these races and carrying a, you know, a 40-pound sandbag on my shoulder, just doing dumb, crazy stuff. So they know I'm insane. I don't care. I'm good with that. But to convince a civilian... To do something insane like, hey, can you sit in a car while I push it up and down the street 20 times? Not interested. So what do you do? Well, you reach out to people who are used to getting looked at kind of silly in public, and that are World War II reenactors, right? Because, you know, you're going out in public, and see, people see you wearing these weird uniforms, and they just stare at you. And the first few times you do it, you get kind of self-conscious, but after year eight, you don't care. So I reached out to a buddy of mine who lives probably a mile from here, and he has a 1943 Ford Jeep. And I said, hey, stupid sounding question, but sent him the whole regiment. I said, is this something you're interested in doing? He's like, sure. I get off at 530. I'll be there at 6. Fantastic. So we grabbed up the GoPro gear, went down the other side of the neighborhood by the boat dock where there's no houses. And let me tell you, <laughs> pushing it 100 yards once, not too bad. Twice, started to suck a little bit. That thing kicked my ass. It literally took me, uh, I'm looking right now, 40 minutes, 8 seconds. No, I'm sorry, that was the run before. Um, let me pull up my stats here. It took me close to an hour, and it was getting rough. I mean, and the crazy thing is, you know, I'm just pushing on the back of the tire, right? And that is the comfortable position. Arms out straight, just pushing into it. You try to get comfortable and put a shoulder into it. That's not comfortable at all. Kind of putting short hands and putting your hands over your head. It worked a little bit, but basically you had to suffer through it. it. Took me 55 minutes plus 58 seconds, and that includes the minute breaks. And you know, not only am I doing this routine and filming it, I'm also doing spontaneous interviews. So, Joseph, um, explain to the people what the purpose of non-directional tire tread is. <laughs> Um, if you're restoring one of these, what's one of the most common parts that are hard to find? You know, things like that. Which, by the way, we had an epiphany because a lot of times when you're talking about this stuff out loud, you think of weird things. And so for those of you who don't know at home, um, World War II vehicles, they have what they're called non-directional tires. Well, all that means is when you're looking at the tread pattern in the dirt, you can't tell which way said vehicle was traveling, right? Correct. This yeah. is, I was going to say, this is an audio podcast, <laughs> shaking your head for people at home, they can't see it. So yes, but you know, as well as I do, with the exception of like the scout car and maybe the high command who's zipping around in the Jeep, most vehicles have infantry near them, right? Because a vehicle without infantry is pretty much a dead duck. <laughs> so the fact that our guys aren't wearing non-directional boots, <laughs> the fact you know which way the said vehicle is going <laughs> just by the pattern of the boots are following said truck. So it's, I mean, it makes sense for like a scout car or something like that. Something that's going to be solo. But a majority of these vehicles traveled with infantry. So was it really necessary to put the non-directional tires? But I will say, I said in a video as I'm pushing and, and the video will be up tomorrow on my YouTube channel. I know some people are going to say, well, that's a pretty light vehicle. 
It's 20, 25, 2800 pounds, pretty heavy. Drivers, 210 pounds. And for effect, we did have a 30 cal machine gun mounted on it. So that's another, what, 15, 20 pounds? But I made the observation as I'm dying, pushing this thing, killing myself. The argument could be made that a modern car with directional tires and nice new wheel bearings would probably be a hell of a lot easier to push than that Jeep. So, uh, yes, it may be a little lighter. We are working with old technology, non-directional tires, uh, and some old-ass wheel bearings. So if you guys want to see me suffering through pushing a Jeep, um, that'll be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. I, and by the way, I did this, it's 10 o'clock now. I didn't get done until seven. So this was something I did just a short two or three hours ago. So I'm pretty tired and pretty sore, but, uh, that's just the, the icing on the cake of my weekend. Um, but before we get into it, um, do you want me to get into my weekend or do you want to get into the topic you want to talk about? Uh, well, real quick, while we're way off topic to begin with, <laughs> I did want to mention something uh about uh i just kind of want to give a shout out to educators real quick mm -hmm. uh, i had i had a uh, a college professor of mine send me a message today through uh facebook messenger i haven't seen him or been in his classroom i think in six years okay i took a summer class with him it was environmental science and he just out of the blue sends me this message hey man do you know anybody that will sign up for my environmental class this summer please <laughs> you know Help me out. Like, yeah, I, I don't know if he just had anybody sign up yet, whatever, and the class make it canceled. Okay. And that kind of like, wow, I must have left somewhat of an impression. He remembered me, all those students, all those years teaching, and he reached out to me. And then, of course, he asked about, oh, you know, you're still doing that stuff at the museum and all your, you know, programs and things like that. But it kind of really made me think, uh, I, I, you know, we, we probably take educators for granted more often than not. And to to be humbled like that by by a guy that I haven't seen in five or six years to think of me to help him out to reach out to me I told him I said well uh, I'd love to take it again honestly but here's what I can do uh, I'll mention on our podcast tonight if there's anybody in my area the Burnham Marble Falls area that's going to Central Texas College that's looking for a really cool class hit him up or hit me up I have his number he said hey they can text me. Let's do this. It's a great class. And I'll tell you, there's one thing that I remember from it. We uh, are at 1.6 Earths based on how much material we've used. Wow. And we're at one. Yeah. And we, are at one point, we, we have surpassed the one Earth, like in the 70s. So it's kind of an eye-opening thing, but totally not a history topic. But like I said, and, and since this podcast is about how history is so important and educators – you know, and people who do podcasts, people do reenacting. That is so important. That's what keeps it going. Shout out to you, Zach, for reaching out to me. And I hope that you keep doing good things as an educator, just like Don and I try to do good things as reenactors. It's interesting. Two things. One, on the topic of environmentalism, it's always surprising when you find out what common items that we waste that are non-renewable resources and the number one on that list that'll blow everybody's mind if you weren't paying attention two years ago during the shortage, helium. Yeah. We put helium in kids' balloons. We suck it. We sound like Donald Duck. I don't know what happened. I don't know if they found a new source or what, but like last year, year and a half ago, there was this worldwide shortage on helium to the fact that Party City would have to put up signs. We have helium. The signs are gone. They have helium. I say, well, what's the big deal? We run out of helium, no more party balloons. No, helium is used a lot more than party balloons. Uh, just one of the things they use it for, uh, just no big deal, just for the equipment when performing heart surgery. Whoever thought of all things helium was a non-renewable resource? That's just something we always took for granted as kids. Of course. <laughs> you're, you're a couple years older than me. I don't know if they did this in Texas. Um, in the late 70s and early, I was born in 78, so 78, 980. So around 85, right? Yeah, I'm um, younger than you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, well, you're similar in age compared to some of our <laughs> listeners. Um, but no, what I'm getting at is this trend may have still been effect because environmentalism hadn't kicked in quite yet as to the hardcore. We had this horrible fad in elementary schools in the late and mid-80s where we would get balloons and fill them up with helium and then put a 4x5 um, five, five flashcard on it with our name and the address of the school. 
And then we would all go out into the schoolyard, hundreds of us, and let them go into the environment. And the goal was to see how far the balloon would go and whose card got mailed back to the school. And the furthest it ever made, and the kid who got it blown back, and we'd done this every fucking year. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> every year, you know, four years in elementary school times, let's say, depending on the size of the school, 50 to 100 kids. So over four years, eh, 6,000, 1,500 just balloons thrown into the wild. And this is in Kentucky and Ohio. How many of those just ended up in the woods, creeks, rivers? <laughs> just So not only are we wasting helium... <laughs> We're putting rubber into the environment and paper, postcards. Lo and behold, people would return the postcards and the kids would win the prizes. But just the downright stupidity and lack of, you know, and this was at the time where Woods of the Owl and Smokey the Bear were at their all time high. I give a hoot, don't pollute and all that. I give a hoot, don't pollute, but let's go let some helium balloons out into the air with postcards on them and see if they make it to Ohio. Oh, oh yeah. the 80s. Weren't they great? Uh, the second thing you're talking about educators, I won't get into it, but back in high school, we had a, one of our guidance counselors had a program um, where basically they would try to break down cliques, um, get kids over, you know, financial classes, all, you know, don't talk to kids, he don't have cool clothes and all that. And, and then to have like lock-ins and we would break into small groups. Anyhow, the, the counselor who headed that up Part of that whole program was a lot of like writing handheld, handwritten notes to you know kids with um, compliments and this and that. And I did that for like three or four years, and then I, when my senior year, I was I was over and moved on. But uh, just recently, like a year ago, and now he's since retired. He he retired before my daughter graduated. He still sends me. He just started this, but basically, he sends me at least once a month. He'll print out memes. Or like um, inspirational sayings, and then he'll handwrite letters around them. And he's not just doing it for—he's like doing it to like six or seven of us that per, that played a major role in that sort of uh, program he had. But it's just so cool to, especially in the day and age. I mean, he could easily just hit me up on Facebook. Yo, what's up, dude? Sits down and handwrites, fills out the envelope, puts the stamp on it. And I haven't got around to, but I really want to get like an old school V-mail envelope and write <laughs> some letter back, like as if I'm on the front line and just send it back to him. Because when's the last time you've handwritten a letter and mailed it to somebody? How cool is that? And the fact that it's a guy who was my counselor in 1996, 1995, so long ago. And like you said, it's it's just interesting when you have an educator or a former guidance counselor after 25 years just reach out to you. Like, hey, what's up? It's like, yeah. wow. That guy does care. And yeah, this it's pretty special. And this guy so, is like a super saint. He ended up like adopting like seven kids, had three bi biological kids. I mean, this guy was just, he's, awesome. he's damn near a saint. Yeah. Well, uh, that's probably a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, as far as people who, you know, leave an impression on you and, and um, you know, people who become mentors and everything. And I think for, for all of our listeners, and I know you and I, uh, included uh, there's been that one world war ii vet right there's mm -hmm. always been that one world war ii vet that was like he stood out he was special or she you know they, they just meant a lot to you and maybe is why we study or maybe that's why some of uh some of you reenact you know because of meeting this one particular vet and i, I have multiple war ii vets like that in my life i've been lucky you know i mean i, I there's been probably a half dozen that have all had that kind of an impact on me and I'd like to talk about one of those tonight um, because the story is really cool. I will. Um, this is why it's so important to go to air shows, guys. I mean, air shows. This is like air show. It's America, <laughs> you know. Like, uh, and I can't wait. I'm going to be going. There's an air. There's an air. I'm not calling it an air show, but it's like an air display, whatever mm -hmm. it is, down in San Marcos, the Centex wing of CAF. Um, this weekend, I'm going to go down there on Sunday. I'm not working it. They didn't ask me to go or do anything like usually i'm usually there performing in some way or, or demonstrating i'm going as a civilian i'm just going to dress up in air corps and play uh and get some pointers from they have a really nice museum down there uh fifi the b29 is flying in um I, I, so always good stuff when you go to an air show so there i was at an air show in this was september of 1998 so i'm still living in jersey then still in south jersey and i volunteered at, a, at an airport there little regional airport and they had a really awesome air show and of course dude 
1998. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of World War II vets alive. You know, that's so, my or, biggest regret that is I didn't start this eight years ago, five years exactly. ago. Oh, yeah, for sure. Imagine 20 years ago. Well, the technology so, wasn't there. Yeah, I would have loved just to have a, a handheld tape recorder and been right. interviewing people. Right. So I had this guy come up to me and says, hey, can, can you give me a hand with something? I said, yeah, sure. So there's an enclosed trailer and it's got uh, Ontario tags on it. And he opens up inside this trailer, and it's a glider. And since I was volunteering there, he asked me as part of the air show. Like a hang glider? To... Well, not a hang glider. It, it, you, you sit in it. You pilot this glider. Okay, like the ones with the fan on the back? No, they're pulled. Oh, okay. They're, they're oh, so you mean like a legitimate truck. glider glider, like yeah. a fiberglass? So, oh, okay, cool. One of those. Now, are those considered so that... ultralights? I Maybe. So that's me there, and uh, and then this is the pilot right here, and he says, "Hey, you need to help me, you know, build this thing." So we did. I helped him put the wings on and everything, and they hooked him up. And when he took off, there was a guy traveling with him, and said, "Hey, uh, you know who that is?" "Oh, just an old guy with a glider." <laughs> <laughs> he goes, "Well, when he lands, um, you're going to want to talk to him." Okay. So he comes up to me. And, uh, you know, we take another picture. It's this one here is kind of a better a close up of us. Nice. With his with his glider. It says Wings of Man. That was the name of his um, uh, his program, I guess you could say. OK. And, and he signed one of these for, and gave me this. His Wings of Man thing. Thanks to my crew. And he asked me, he says, what uh, what's your favorite airplane? So we started talking about World War Two, you know, and I said, oh, man, I'd probably the B-17. And he goes, oh, man, those are easy to knock down. <laughs> this is him as a young wow. man. Wow. German pilot. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. That looked like I was muted. So, yeah. Um, so the guy that was traveling with him said, uh, yeah, this, this, is, this is Oscar Bosch. Uh, he's one of the uh, few remaining guys from his squadron. He's a Luftwaffe he was- pilot? Yeah, That's shot insane. down six times. Wow. Uh, shot, I think he said shot down four times in a 109, twice in a 190. And they had just gotten back in April of 98, so about six months prior. They were over in Germany to have a reunion for their squadron. And this young guy that was traveling with them had organized the reunion. And he made 60 of these there were four pilots still alive from Sturmstaff alone. And these are the four guys, hand-signed, all four of them, hand-signed in golden ink. And he made 60 of these. That's badass. That's it. This guy, they didn't have a picture for, but he's the one who designed the squadron insignia. So this is one of 60 hand-signed by these four pilots in April of 1998. And I just got to sit there. And talk to Oscar Bosch. That's and he would tell me how he shot down B-17s and what it was like flying for the Luftwaffe. So, again, there I am as a 15-year-old kid standing next to this guy. Um, definitely one of the World War II vets that stands out, uh, especially in my mind, for having an impression on a young guy and, you know, just being able to hang out and, and listen to him. Just that, and I, looking back, I bet you he enjoyed it just as much as I did to be 70 some years old and have a 15 year old kid know kind of what you're talking about and appreciate it and want to hear it. I think we fed off of each other. Um, so again, that's just like, uh, you know, an educator or, you know, somebody, a mentor from your past. Uh, it's important. And I hope. I hope the veterans of my generation 50 years from now remember that. You know, what, what you said there um, kind of struck a, a memory for me. This, and another example, this is probably three years before I started doing the podcast. Um, I just finished reading um, the Sid Phillips' book and uh, Robert Leckie's book. Both of them talk about, um, on the way down, how they stopped in Melbourne and they had the dock union strike and that's when the uh, basically the union workers at the docks felt that they were underpaid and they didn't want to uh, reload the boats b-17 
because we shipped out so quickly we didn't battle load the boats. So instead of having ammo parsed throughout all the boats, food, basically all the ammo was on one boat, all the food was on one boat, all the uniforms one boat. So when we got down to Melbourne, we had to offload them, allocate them, battle load them, and basically provision them evenly throughout the boat. So that way if you lost a boat, you wouldn't lose everything. But the, um, the Melbourne union workers said, nah, we don't want to work these hours. We don't like the high demands and we're not getting paid enough. So they went on a strike. And the Navy and the Marine Corps said, no big deal. We got plenty of men and half of them here are farmers and uh, machinists. They know how to work the equipment. And so they had them on 24 hour shifts, offloading, reloading, and then it rained the whole damn time. And so like all your D rations and K ration boxes were getting wet. They're talking about like there's mounds of corn flakes from all the boxes breaking apart. All the labels would fall off the can. So you didn't know later on when you're, being deployed, you didn't know if that can you got was peaches, pears, what was in it, because all the labels fell off the cans. But anyhow, I was down at Fort Myers Beach, and I was walking off of a job I do for an ice cream parlor, and there's a guy sitting in the passenger seat, and he had a hat on with the um, the Marine Corps um, First Division patch on his hat. And I said, oh, thanks for your service. Oh, thank you. What years did you serve? 41 to 45. I was like, uh, so we, now a lot of people would instantly want to start talking about battle in this and that, right? And the stuff you hear about TV, I said, were you in Melbourne during the union strikes? <laughs> and he was like, yes, I was. And we spent 20 minutes talking about it. Not one that I asked him about killing Japs or in combat. Just, we basically talked about Melbourne and Australia the whole time. And he was so delighted to see, I was probably, you know, mid thirties to see some random 30 year old not only know about World War II, but know about something as mundane as the Melbourne Bay Union strike and the 24-hour shifts of offloading. And we talked about basically all the Liberty stuff he did, not the battle stuff. And it brought a smile to his face and those memories. And that's another thing I, I so wish I did the podcast back then. But it was just so cool talking to him about just the other activities involved in, you know, in the Pacific and, and all, the, all that stuff. And it was so damn cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's something that people need to understand is how many millions of guys went over there, never fired their rifle, never saw combat. There's so much more to it. And, you know, some of that stuff, like I said, is almost just as miserable with yeah. what they were doing in conditions. And there is no glory. when you, Because like you said, they get home and like, oh, you know, how many did you kill? Or, you know, what did you do? Did you get any medals? No, I supplied these guys you know, like, i drove for the red ball express yeah exactly but that's all still that's all the cogs in the wheel that make you know our our, our combat team successful and you know that's that crazy. out of the two of us you know that better than anybody you've yeah, been well, on the front I mean, line it, it, you know what it's like to be in need of things and to have those resupplies come in and how thankful you are for the guys whose job it is to get that resupply to you that's and the right. jo- and the job of the guy who is to get that material to the guy who brings it in all the way back to you know the it's just the logistics of war regardless if it's back in 1942 or now th- what it takes to get supplies from point A to point B and everywhere in between and all the little fingers that get involved in steel before it gets to you <laughs> it's just it's just so much work and they yeah. definitely don't get the credit they deserve no, no, that's what, I mean, supplies are what, de- that decides a battle. I mean, Darius knew that when he was attacking, you know, Thermopylae in 300 BC or whatever it was, or 480 BC, I guess it was, but yeah. And that um, was the basic, um, that was the basic routine and thought behind the island hopping campaigns of the Pacific. <laughs> Why go to, um, I just drew a complete blank. I can't believe it. Um, the island, the, the J- J- Japan's main island, um. Oh, can't believe I just completely drew a blank. Um, and the Solomons, they basically they're on the oh, Guadalcanal. No, not Guadalcanal. The main island they were stationed on, though we never went to. We basically took all the islands around it, thus cutting off their supply and, and all that, and just left them to. Uh, oh, I can't. Rabal. Yeah, Rabal. We never invaded Rabal. We didn't need to. We took all the islands around it. We cut off their supply. They no longer had fuel to fuel their planes. They no longer had food to feed their men. Why lose men fighting them when you can? lose less men fighting for the islands around them, more strategic islands and just cut them off. Right. It's hard to win a war when you don't have supply. Speaking of air shows, I'm sure you heard the news and saw this, but we haven't been, we haven't been together a while. Dateline Cocoa beach, April 20th. 
This is sad. Cocoa Beach, Florida. A restored World War II airplane came crashing down along the busy Florida beaches while the water were filled with people. Witnesses told Florida Today they heard the BM Avengers engine sputtering down the beach and they knew something was off when the plane suddenly descended Saturday during the Cocoa Beach Air Show. Quote, it looked like the pilot pulled up at the last minute to avoid any spectators. There were loads of people in the water, and then I saw him on top of the plane. It looked like he was okay. So this guy basically, engine failure or whatever, busy-ass beach, and he landed this thing in the water probably 30 yards off the dry land, didn't hit a single person, um, complete masterful flighting on his side. Uh, the air show released statements saying that the plane had mechanical issues and that the rescued personnel were standing by during the emergency landing. The plane was a torpedo bomber used by the U.S. Navy during World War II. According to the Cocoa Beach Air Show's website, the plane underwent extensive restoration before returning to the flight last year. Apparently not enough, but uh, the footage of that, and it just hurts. Not only the footage of it landing, but they showed like footage later on the day where it's just sitting in the water right on the beach, and they have caution tape and the military vehicles or from the air show just sitting there waiting to figure out how we're going to get this thing out of the water causing the least amount of damage it's just so heartbreaking to see that shit happen yeah yeah unfortunately it's part of it um so i need your all's help before the show and i and i had stumbled on this in the past um my grandfather he served we, we briefly talked about but we never really jumped in depth because i don't have in-depth information um, I've looked on the National Archives. I have his service tag. My dog tags are exact replicas when he passed. And uh, when I started reenacting, my aunt sent me a photo of his dog tag. So I went to one of those World War II dog tag sites. And my army dog tags are exact replicas of his. Has his name, his birth date, his, his route service tag, his next to kin. And so I went on the National Archives. And I've done this a few times before. Um, serial numbers right there. Name, Preston Woods. C for Coleman. Resident state number two, which is Kentucky. Uh, residential county was 015, which is Boone County. Uh, place of enlistment, Cincinnati, Ohio. Here's the cool date thing. Enlistment date. And my dog's down here snoring. For those you watching on YouTube, I do have the dog cam on. So if you hear snoring, it's my little boss and terrier down there snoring. But uh, enlistment date, January 1st, 1942. So basically, as soon as he turned 18, he enlisted. He would have enlisted sooner. He may even be a little younger. Um, grade designation, private, um, grade code eight, private. Then it says branch alpha designation, branch, um, immaterial warrant officers, us. I don't know what that means. Then it says terms of enlistment value five. So I think it was five years. Uh, then it explains enlistment for the duration of the war or other emergencies plus six months subject to the discretion of the president. Otherwise, according to law. Um, then Kentucky, yada, yada, yada. But here's the crazy thing. I can't find what unit he served in in 1942, but, and I don't have the picture. I'll, I'll put it up on, um, our Facebook page and I'll put it on the page for this website. I have his wedding photo and in his wedding photo, he's wearing his uniform and there's a division patch on his left arm. And that division patch is for the 15th army. But here's the interesting part. I just read you his service. He enlisted in. December 1st, 1942. The 15th United States Army was the last field army to see service in Northwest Europe during World War II and was the final command for General George S. Patton. The 15th Army served uh, two separate missions and assigned, and assigned to the area. During the later stages in the war, its missions were training and rehabilitation of units and acting in defense against counterattacks. After the war, its mission was to carry out occupation duty and to gather historical information related to the European theater operations of the war. How cool is that that my grandfather was assigned to a unit that's job was to gather historical information? And here we are. But here's where the mystery is. We know that he enlisted in 1942, right? We know that on his wedding date, he had a patch for the 15th Army. The 15th Army... Um, wasn't activated until 1944. And since I can't see his right shoulder on that photo, I don't know what his previous division patch was. Or where, where did he, he get married? Well, 
if the 15th Army wasn't activated until August 21st of 1944, and in his wedding photo he has the patch on his left arm, clearly it was after August 1st, uh, 21st of 1944. Otherwise, that unit didn't exist and he wouldn't have had the patch on his arm. So if he enlisted on December 1st of 1942, but then had a 25th, I'm sorry, a 15th Army patch on his shoulder during his wedding photo, where was he the first two years? Was, the, was he assigned to a division? Was he stateside? So before the show, I took a service number and I started scanning. I try to find a website that actually gives you legit free information. And I found one that I put in there and they want like, I'm, I'm probably going to have to pay the trial because now they got me hooked. They showed a thumbnail image of his, even though he wasn't drafted, of his quote unquote draft card. And so um, when I ran a service tag, on some of these other websites who don't give you the information for free. Some of them are claiming they got some information. So I'm going to have to, I guess, fork over some money. And or if someone listening to this podcast knows where those websites get their information from, if you guys know a website other than uh, the NARA, because that's where I already went, um, to get information on service personnel, please let me know because I'd really like to solve this. I've asked my uncle and my aunt. They have all his letters and all that stuff. They're just in a basement of the old house somewhere. They don't know where it's at. Um, I've been trying for years to get this information, but I'm really interested to see where he was before, prior to August 21st, 1944 and being assigned to the uh, 15th army. Cause uh, well, he's my grandfather and it would be nice to, if I knew what divisions he were, it'd be kind of nice to build an impression around it. Right? So when I go to an event, I can explain, Hey, here's who my grandfather served with. Here's, you know, I could even do a little, timeline if you will at a museum on his service time only thing i do know and this is probably why he never talked about it at some point he worked grave registration so his job was to go out there and uh, gather up and bury our lost and so clearly he didn't talk about that at all but that's that's the only information i've ever been able to get off my family oh he he was in europe and he worked grave registration and we don't talk about it hmm. and so now it's up to me to try to track it down using the internet so um, if anybody has any ideas of where I can go, let me know. Um, here's a little something cool that came across my timeline. Um, six World War II inventions that changed everyday life. Before I read these off, do you have any guesses? I, I probably saw the same article because I shared it with some of my colleagues the other day. Something the History Channel put out? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, go ahead and just uh, pick one. Oh, penicillin? Penicillin, they have that listed as number two. Uh, before the widespread use of antibiotics like penicillin, the United States, even, I'm sorry, in the United States, even small cuts and scrapes could lead to deadly infections. Ain't that the truth? My little dog here who's sleeping had to go to the vet this week because she got a cat scratch on her head and it got infected. And now she's, uh, for those of you on YouTube, you guys can see her sleeping on their back with her feet kicked up in the air. Um, so yeah, small scrapes can cause infections. Uh, do, 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 do. the Scottish scientist Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in 1928, but it wasn't until you, uh, world war two that the United States began to mass produce it as a medical treatment. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you got another one you want to pick? Uh, uh plasma radar, yep, plasma radar. Here's an interesting though. One of the electronic computer. Which is kind oh, of yeah. now they had to put electronic before computer because they used to refer to their secretary pool as computers. Um, in 1940s, the word computer referred to people, mostly women, who preferred complex calculations by hand. But during World War II, the United States began to develop new machines to do calculations for ballistics, trajectories, and those who had been doing com uh, com computer com com. <laughs> Compute, comp, whatever by hand. I don't know why I'm having a problem with that word. Computations, Computations. by hand okay. took the job programming <laughs> of these machines. If you're an IT guy, I wouldn't no. struggle on computations. But I did. <laughs> I am. I do have a learning disability, and and that goes back to when I was in the second grade. Um, yeah, radar, which just kind of makes sense. You suck in too much helium. Is that what you're gonna yeah, say? too much helium. Blood, tra uh, blood, tra uh, blood plasma transfusions. Uh, here's a cool photo of medic uh, medics tending to a wounded soldier on D-Day. During World War II, the U.S. surgeons named Charles Drew standardized the production of blood plasma for medical use. I learned this weekend um, 
one of the guys from Georgia had a great first aid tent set up and he actually had a mermite can. You ever seen those? Those are pretty damn cool. And because we didn't have refrigeration on the front lines, the um, first aid staff, I'm just laughing at my dog, used mermite cans to keep the plasma as cool as they could for as long as they possibly could. Obviously, these things aren't Yeti coolers. They're not going to keep things cold for four days. But um, to get them from the, the local ice house and or refrigeration unit to the front line for use or to the medic tent, they would put them in mermite cans. Um, they developed the whole system where they would send two sterile jars, one with water in it and the other one with, with freeze dried blood plasma and then mix them together. Unlike uh, whole plasma, unlike whole blood plasma can be given to anyone regardless of the person's blood type, making it easier to administrate on the battlefield. So that's a cool little story you guys can find on, um, the history channel. Before we go, I want to talk about this weekend. Um, it was a good time. It was a place called the Pioneer Village in Dade City, Florida. And I guess it's like, we call it the first event, but um, Joseph, who provided the Jeep for me tonight, was telling me he was up there about a, a few or three, two or three weeks ago. So I guess technically that was their first event. But first and foremost, this is kind of like the Pioneer Villages that you're used to seeing. You know, they got like a log cabin here. They got the blacksmith up there tinking away. But the cool thing was, is this is like place has kind of become the repository for historical buildings. They had a single, an original single room schoolhouse that they relocated to this place with all the, the accoutrements inside, all the super small desks, the chalkboards and all that. Um, they had um, a train station set up, which made for fantastic photo op um, and a cool video that I posted on my TikTok page. And then they had a museum in it that had a little storefront. And so just like every living history event, we had our little bivouac set up with, you know, the allied tents and, and people to have their displays. And during the day, people would come down and they would talk to us and we do the normal living history stuff. And Jeremy and company came down from Georgia, which they always, they're pretty much Florida reenactors. These guys are always coming down from Georgia. They have a great, 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 great field set up. They basically do, um, EE8 telephones, switchboards, all that stuff. I mean, they, they set it up. It's so cool when we do these huge, bigger events, we actually have comm lines because they got like six or seven E8 telephones. So we'll have a OP out there with a phone. So we can actually communicate with, you know, air correct equipment when we're trying to do the logistics for a big public event. So they had their stuff set up. They got there on Thursday. I got there Saturday morning. So they drove down from Georgia on Thursday, set up their bivouac. Friday, a school came out of about 200 kids. They did a great living history with um, Art, Meg, and some of the other Florida reenactors who were there. And that was great. And then the kids went home, and then you do the activities you usually do when a museum closes after hours. The problem was our bivouac was set up about 50 yards from a very, very active train track, dual track. And all day long, and all night long. trains came through now this is very authentic because most of travel came through world war ii it was on train and that's fine that's great but let's say saturday night after you've been out in the sun all day talking to the people do a 45 minute battle reenactment which you guys can see a compilation on our youtube channel right now I just post it up so head over to youtube and look for digital 410 or go to wtsp world war com and click on the link there and while you're there go ahead and click on that patreon link sign up as a dollar a month but uh, after you do these reenactments and you're hot and you're laying on the ground because, damn it, you're authentic and all you got your wool blanket. Now, about 100 yards down from where we're bivouacked, there is a street crossing of the train tracks that do not have the fancy arms. So that means every single train that comes through, regardless of what time of day it is, has to honk the air horn. So you're trying to get sleep because you're rolling around on the hill and it's hard ground choo, choo. Huh, huh? but that ain't the worst part the worst part is is that these trains sound like they haven't had a drop of lubricant on their wheels and or brakes in the last 38 years and so while you're trying to sleep in your tent it sounds like 30 banshees are scratching 300 chalkboards in your tent and your head's about to explode and by this happens once or twice an hour, by the way, Jeff. And so when you fall asleep at 10 o'clock, by 3 in the morning, you're crawling out of your skin. It got to the point where I put in my earplugs that I use for the reenactment just to try to minimize, not alleviate, 
not delete, not remove, but minimize the screeching of the fucking banshees that are ripping through your tent. It got so bad that like two of the people who got there on Thursday and slept through this Thursday and Friday, they lived like 45 minutes away. Saturday night, they said, to hell with this. I'm going home. I need more than two hours worth of sleep. But the guys from Georgia who went through that for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then finally went home Sunday, I just had to have one night of it. And that was Saturday. I had had enough. I was like, if I ever hear another train, it would be too soon. So uh, next year, if we do it again, we're going to move our bivouac to as far away from the train tracks as possible so we can get some more sleep. But, um, and it rained that morning. They were saying, well, it's going to rain tonight at 3 a.m. So we're all bunkered down in our little pump tits expecting a rainstorm to roll through. And we're kind of sleeping on an incline. So I'm at the top. I'm not too worried about it. If the rain comes, it'll just wash down. Rain didn't come until like 10 o'clock the next morning, which was great because, you know, I actually had time to tear my, on Sunday, tear my tent down so that I didn't have to worry about drying it up before packing it up. Um, no rain on Saturday. Um, it rained like a bastard early Sunday morning. And the event didn't really start until 2 o'clock as far as the battle rain act. And since it rained early, uh, as happens, you know, rain keeps spectators away. And so the spectators and the, the public, they dribbled in, but we didn't see half the numbers like we did the day before when it was nice and, and warm out. And I got to thinking, well, I brought my class a uniform because I heard there was a USO show. Little did I know the USO show was going on throughout the day. They weren't actually having a USO show at night for the reenactors like often happens. And I... As I so exuberantly exclaimed a few episodes back, I finally got a classic uniform that fits me, an Eisenhower jacket. And I was going to wait until the end of the day, but I knew I was tired. So I was like, well, we got a few hours to kill. Let me get a wardrobe change like Cher. And so I put on my class A uniform, which you saw the photos on Instagram. And you know what the cool part about those photos are? They were taken by random people at the museum with my phone. I put the filters on them, but like the one where I'm walking in the general store... Um, the one on the bar, the long shot, I just put on a 10 second timer. but this lady came in, I said, Hey, can you do me a favor? Can you just get a picture of me real quick? She said, Oh, my husband's a photo, a photo uh, photographer. So he'll, he'll probably criticize me. She took like 30 photos. Sweet. <laughs> um, Paul, who's a reenactor. He took the ones of me in front of the train station, but he had to go do his USO, um, act. He does a great Laurel and Hardy. Who's on first. <laughs> um, and then the one where I'm like picking at the candy, I was in the museum and there's like these two, I don't know, eight, nine year old girls. Kids are good with technology. Hey, come here. <laughs> Here's my camera. She shot like three of those photos. The ones of me looking like I'm buying candy. So it's so cool. Cause everybody's like, Oh my God, these photos are amazing. Who took your photo? I'm like random people at the museum. And that makes it even cooler. The fact that, the, you know, I put the filters on them using my programs, but the, the angles and all that, just random people at the museum. And, um, you know, that's one of the hard things to do. Like if you're at a living history event, get in the energy to change and take off the leggings, go get the wool trousers on, get the tie on. And you're outside and it's 89 degrees outside. Now you're wearing a wool shirt with the ice and iron jacket. And it was kind of a pain if I did do it. But after I got the photos and I'm home, I'm so glad I did. And there's so many times I go to events where I, I plan to go get some cool photos, but I'm, you're just too tired, you're worn out, you're out in the hot sun, you've been talking all day, your throat hurts, your back hurts. And there's so many events where I don't even do it. But I'm so glad that I did, and it definitely energized me. And it got a lot of attention on Instagram. It's the most Instagram um, feedback I've had in a while. Both the What's the Scuttlebutt Facebook page are up on there. My Southwest Florida World War II page. And everybody seems to enjoy the photos. Uh, we got a cool little video. We're all sitting in the train station because we all just have on our on our um, wool shirts and our overseas caps, and we have our leggings on. But other than that, and Hunter has his full gear on, his web gear. He's got turn on his face. I go, you can't sit with us. You look like you walked off the front line. And you messed the picture up. But we did a video where he's walking by, and I get up my smack his ass, and I posted that online. But um, it was a great time. Um, I did record an episode, so the next episode following this one will be me interviewing Paul, who does the um, Abbott and Costello bit. I will say it's going to be a little echoey because we're filming it in a, basically a, a pole barn that's full of citrus historical equipment. It's like, a because um, we're in Florida, it's a citrus museum. So I'm like laying on hardwood floor. I got my less than stellar microphones because I don't want to... I don't want to take my studio mics out there because these cost too much if they get stolen. Whereas if my, the old 
mics for those of you who've been around since day one the first series microphones we use on this podcast they retail for like 30 bucks so if those get stolen and or lost it's not a big deal but the ones i have in studio now which have a better quality which i'll probably take the next time if i'm lucky enough to interview a world war ii vet or someone around at the time i'll take these microphones to get a better quality but you know if i'm in a barn or somewhere whatever i'll just take anyhow discovered one of my microphones has a short in it but we made it work but it's at the end of the day we're both exhausted so i'm like laying on the floor on the hardwood floor of the citrus museum with my head underneath the microphone because if i even touch it it would make this obnoxious noise so i'm laying on the floor talking in my microphone paul's talking to the other microphone some of the reenactors is damn nazis with their hobble toed boots come clomping through you'll hear a train go by in the background long story short i gotta do some major editing try to do some noise compression on it but uh the episode following this one will be the one of me and paul so you guys can look forward to that and it was so nice to get out there oh Real quick, I know we're running a little long. This is the first time in all these years this has ever happened to me. So before the Georgia event, I ordered some ammo from our friends at Atlantic Wall Blank. I've always got my ammo from there. never had a problem. Now it's COVID and I'm not blaming them, but the shipping took forever and three days. To the fact that when the Georgia event back in January rolled around, my ammo was going to be there on Monday and I had to leave on Friday. So my ammo wasn't this uh, going to show up until after the event. Luckily, Jerry Oxley, who's been on uh, this show, been on a lot of my YouTube videos, he lives in Bradenton, 50 miles away north in the direction which I was going. I reached out to him. He always has a stock ammo. So he said, hey, I left a bag of ammo on my front porch. Stop by and get it. Don't worry about it. I said, cool. When I get my ammo in, I'll just drop it off and we'll trade out. So anyhow, get the ammo, go to Georgia, have a good time. Come back Monday, my ammo's here, throw out my ammo can, don't even look at it. That was in January. We're in April now. Now, I've had some issues with my firearm in the past at events where I will shoot an end block or two, and then for some reason my charging handle gets dislodged from my carrier bolt, and I'm field stripping the damn thing on the field, reassembling it, putting it back in, whatever. So I said, that's not going to happen today. This is my first event since January. I got time. So I set up my camera and I feel I cleaned the hell out of my one. I'm cleaning the gas cylinder. I'm cleaning the, you know, I'm taking it apart. I'm cleaning every bit. I'm scrubbing. I'm oil. I'm not today. Not going to have any problems. Assemble the thing. And you guys will see this on the video. Um, the video, I basically, the first day I did handheld stuff on the field. And the second day I put up static cameras. And I just mixed them all together. Make it look like one video. Get out there, shoot one round, boom, awesome. Pull the trigger, nothing happened. What the? Running, ducking, diving, prone and crawling. Pull up, nothing. Ch charge the next round, nothing. Pick up the ammo, don't see any contact made. There's no firing pin marks. Put them in my pocket. Now, I did notice that my ammo can, my oil, for that, my, that I kept my oil can opened up, and there's a little bit of oil down in the bottom of the can. Maybe some of the ammo got wet. Maybe the powder's wet. But once again, I'm not seeing a marker. I'm not seeing an indentation on the blasting cap showing that the the firing pin had struck it. So anyhow, unload it, load up another end block, crawl, pull up, pull up, pull the trigger, nothing. Son of a bitch. Maybe my maybe I have too much oil on my gun. Maybe I don't know. So I get up. They're yelling recovery fire. Somebody else isn't shooting. I jump down. I I throw him my end block. He puts in his gun, pulls up, nothing happens. Okay, it's an ammo issue now. Now I know it's not my gun. He can't get the round out of his gun. We're in the middle of the field. Luckily, I know it's not error correct. You guys don't have to yell at me. But I have one of like the Korean War gun cleaning rod kits that fit in the butt stock of the M1. So I put the pole together. We shove it down his barrel. We eject the round that didn't detonate. He ejects the end block, puts his in, gets up, starts shooting. Long story short, we go and do our debrief. And I'm, I'm like, what the hell is going on with my gun? Just did a 45-minute reenactment, shot one round, and the rest of the time I was basically going through the motions and not shooting anything. So I'm talking to another reenactor, Chris, like, well, let me see your rounds. Well, I'm not seeing any indentations on the on the um, blasting caps from your firing pin. So he, I give my gun, and he's playing with the bolt. The firing pin's coming out. You cock it back. You can see it's ready to go and all that stuff. Don't see any damage on my firing pin. He pulls out my round, he pulls out one of his and compares it. 
the round is the same length, a little bit shorter, but the neck is lower. And what we discovered was I got sent the wrong ammo. Because of the place of the neck, Beating too far in the air. it was sitting too far into the, uh, the chamber or the head spacing and the firing pin was never making contact. And so after the debrief, we went and I looked in my bag and I found the paper in the bottom of the bag, which I never inspected for as like eight by five, seven for bolt action rifles only. Well, shit, it's Saturday. Now I have no ammo for the event tomorrow. Luckily, there's a young cat there who has more guns than he knows what to do with. So he gave me like 40 bucks for the lot. I turned around, bought like five or six in blocks of somebody else. So I had six in blocks for Sunday, went out, fired, didn't have any problems. But that was the first time I've ever gotten the wrong ammo. Problem being is I got the wrong ammo in January. How can I go? Luckily, Hunter bought it because I wouldn't be able to go back to him and say, hey, you know, four months ago, you sent me the wrong ammo. They'd be like, tough shit. You should have checked it four months ago. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what you use 8 by 5 7s for, uh, but it ain't an M1, and it's not a 1903. I tried it, We tried it in a 1903 Springfield, and it same headspace issue, so I couldn't sell it to that guy. But Hunter said, like, I'll buy it. So uh, shout out to Hunter for buying the ammo that I couldn't use on my gun. So when you see me carrying the camera in the video and you see me pulling my gun up and it don't fire, that's why. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. All in all, I had a good time. I'm super excited to be back. Sadly, though, we're here in Florida, um, Lake Glen, Florida. No, Zephyr Hills, Florida is doing a D-Day Living History event. No reenactment, which is fine, but it's outside and it's in June. And it's ah. D-Day. You're not wearing HBTs doing a D-Day Living History event. You're going to be wearing an M41 jacket, a wool shirt, wool trousers, <laughs> Full gear standing out in 98 degree Florida sun. So I'm not sure if I'm going to make that one. We try to do most of our events in the wintertime here in Florida because of that. But, uh, hey, it is what it is. So uh, you got anything else before we go out? Yeah, well, I think just uh, quickly, um, you know, we talked about, man, we should have done this podcast so many years ago. And, you know, like I said, sometimes it's a pain in the neck to take, you know, to take quality pictures sometimes. You, know, you mm-hmm. got to get changed. You got to get or you're just going to ruin it and just why even do it. Um, but so it's a good thing you did because, you know, like you said, it, you got to document the stuff when you can. And I know from my perspective, I've never been able to just play at a reenact. I'm always in charge of it typically. And I never get to take the cool pictures. I watch 20 of my reenactors all doing these cool poses. You know, I get, I get home like the next day and see all their stuff on social media. Like, Oh, that must've been a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm running around. That happens. But let me tell you, that's gonna change. That's gonna start changing, you know. Yeah, uh, big time for me. I'm gonna start just enjoying this, and you know, I, I've done a lot of things uh, where World War II veterans have been there, and I've never been able to take the time afterward to talk with them. Uh, everybody else did, but I didn't, and that's important to me. So, uh, yeah, be looking for me to to start, um, you know, getting around a little bit more from a private reenacting standpoint, and um, you know, shout out to Highland Lakes Air Museum here that voted me in as the director back over the summer and some really cool things are about to start happening. We're, we're, so if you're in my area, if you're in central Texas and you're familiar with the commemorative air force, uh, in Vernon, we've got the Highland Lakes air museum. We just had a record air show last month. There were 4,000 people Don, I will send you the video. We had somebody actually put together a video, a collage, about a seven minute video of the air show last month. It's really well done. You see the rain actors, you see the aircraft, the eight tens. Is it up know, on YouTube? Uh, I don't think it's on YouTube, but uh, you can put it up. Well, I was going to say, if it's on YouTube, if you send me the link, I can just embed the link into our What's the Scuttlebutt uh, uh, podcast webpage, and people can watch it there. But if not, you can send it to me, and we can upload it and give it credit to whoever, and then put the link up so people can see it right on our website. Um, Like, And if you go there right now, go to WTSPWorldWar2.com, and you'll see a post of this last weekend's event two things that you said um one it's very important no matter how tired and my god god change do the photos there's so many events that i just too tired and and monday like you said monday rolls around and you're on instagram you're on facebook you're seeing all these badass photos like oh that's when they said hey i'm gonna go take photos and i'm like i'm gonna lay in my tent and 
drink out of my canteen and, and smoke Lucky Strikes. You guys have fun. And I don't even have a photo of me smoking Lucky Strikes in my tent, so I don't even have a photo of that. Um, so get off your ass. Go take the photos. You'll be happy to. And two, somebody worked in radio for six years. And I worked in radio, kind of, well, one, right before, three, two or three years before COVID, but it was right at the apex of live concerts in Southwest Florida. We had Fort Rock, one and two and three, I think. We had uh, Rock Wave, all these different events. And these are all day, and at the end, they're two-day festivals, right? Rock festivals. And I worked at the radio station who either, well, the first few we actually invented and put on but because anyhow after a while the other radio stations got included but like you were saying while everybody else is out in the crowd watching the concerts and doing this yes it was cool that we had a tent and we're literally talking to you know shannon larkin and those guys from godsmack uh we're talking to guys from papa roach megadeth and all that just like when you meet these you know famous you know world war ii veterans and all that yes in hindsight you may have a few photos but during that time you're in work mode you're not in holy crap i'm hanging out with celebrity modes you're like okay we gotta get these guys interviewed gotta get this done in 15 minutes gotta line up the next one then we gotta go to stage announcements we gotta tell everybody at the fire marshal wants to make sure they drink at least one water between each beer so they don't get dehydrated we gotta throw out t-shirts and when you're in that work mode even though you're around all these cool people it's not like you're sitting down and having a discussion with them you're Doing an interview, like, you know, they're out, in and out in a few seconds. At the end of the day, you're just exhausted. And you're like, what happened? <laughs> you don't even realize. And and like you're saying, when you're the organizer of a living history event, you're the same way. It You're more you're in work mode. So even though all this cool stuff's happening, you could have all these veterans, you could have these cool equipment there. But because you're in work mode and your job is to make sure the show gets put on, that by the time it's done, you don't get to enjoy taking photos, you know, stopping and breathing and taking it all in because you have people, Hey, Oh, by the way, uh, this guy didn't get his food coupon or so-and-so can't get through the check-in with his Jeep. And where is he going to set up his tent and all that stuff? People don't realize the logistics that goes into putting on an event and it's a lot of work. So last thing I'm reading this right now. Nice. I read it as a kid. I read it as a kid, and I'm really enjoying reading it now. So uh, I just started it two nights ago. I'll try to have it done before our next podcast. Who's and, the author on that? Uh, Harry Crosby. He's you know one of the famous navigators from the 100th. And I, I know, I guarantee, this is going to be referenced more than once in the Masters of the Air series because, I mean, I read Masters of the Air, and Don Miller does a great job with it. But the two main actors, well, whatever their names are, they're like set for life now. The two yeah. guys that they portray, Bucky Egan and Bucky uh, Cleveland, uh, two Bucky's, two best friends. Um, that was the two guys that Harry looked up to uh, in, in that squadron. So he's going to get referenced a lot. I mean, this is probably one of the best books maybe ever written about the 100 bomb group. Um, it just seems but, like, then, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, next time you're you're taking pictures of, at a Seaboard Coastline uh, train station or something, make sure you have a valid pass in your hand. Well, see, the crazy thing so don't come get you. <laughs> exactly. Well, the crazy thing, I didn't know the thing was there, right? Because I didn't research this place. We're just walking around like, ooh, there's a train station. That'd be a cool place. And that's the nice thing about some of these museums is, especially when they have a train station or a general store, what a better place if you have a classy uniform, it looks better to wear that in the general store than it does standing in front of your bivouac. It just doesn't make sense that you'd be standing in front of a tent in a classy uniform. But when you're right. pretending to be shopping or waiting for the bus to come or waiting for the train station, they just make awesome, great photos. The HBO series you're re referring to, I don't know if it's because we're reenactors and we've been waiting for this thing, but I found it this weekend. They're just now in almost done with pre-production this thing hasn't even been shot yet i thought they would be in post-production by now no and and i think COVID had a lot to do with that um but it's not an hbo series it's apple interesting yeah that's disappointing so, i, I hate that I'm gonna get to see it uh you know i guess i'll have a dvd box set or something that'll come out but yeah a little bummed about that 
Well, that's like uh, what was the other Tom Hanks uh, Gray Wolf or whatever the hell that was, and no one saw because Graham. yeah, because it was on a streaming service. Yeah, I've never seen it. You know, any people that I know who've never seen the right stuff because it was Apple, it was on uh, Disney Plus. When we shot that thing, and we're doing, I was doing background work on it because I have family members who want to see it. But right. the only people who have Disney Plus are Star Wars fans. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. <laughs> and when we shot it, we had to shoot scenes twice, one with us smoking and one with us just hoarding cigarettes because it was, it was originally double slated to be on the Smithsonian Network as well as Disney Plus. And then they wanted to do a Disney Plus exclusive, hoping that people would subscribe. Which I think the show would have gotten a hell of a lot more views and probably would have got better reviews and maybe even more of a following if it was on an HBO or a Smithsonian network. Um, to the fact that Disney Plus just canceled season two. Um, because, well, once again, no one has Disney Plus unless you're a Star Wars fan. I have some people who want to see it, but they don't want to pay that $9 a month for a service that's next impossible to cancel once it's done. But hopefully they'll shop it around and uh, and find a new location. Sad thing is, and I don't know if it was political or whatever, but they had announced before Season 2 got canceled that they moved production to Southern California. So Florida already lost the productions on Season 2 anyhow, which was sad. But... Um, mm -hmm. Anyhow, it was still a good show, and if you guys haven't seen it, go on Disney Plus and check out the right stuff, and you'll see yours truly in Episode 1 and Episode 4. But I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and joining us. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I know you got some more severe weather heading your way, and hopefully yeah. um, things are going... What's going. What the hell is going on in Texas this year? It's April and May. This is just how it is, man. Yeah. This is this is what it does. This is spring. Yeah, and you say hot, that, man. but when's the last time you've had pumpkin sized hail come and destroy your car? <laughs> Actually, they weren't much bigger than nickels. It was just the velocity that it was coming down. I mean, I've seen baseballs falling from the sky and didn't do anything but bounce off the of stuff. And this just pelted everything. But um, yeah, it's just it is what it is. Uh, but so to our listeners. Uh, I'd love to see some pictures of some famous World War II vets that they've met or World War II vets that mean a lot to them or their favorite air show. Let's see some stuff. I yes. want to see it. We, wanna, it we want interaction with you guys. We want to build a community here. And by the way, it's always nice when I go to these events too because um, like I get there and I go, oh, everybody's been asking if you're coming, this and that. And, you know, because I have a lot of friends there. But every once in a while, I'll get like a new face or someone who – has been reenacting, but really not too much of the stuff that I show up. Oh, you're the guy from the podcast? And then I always do, at Sunday night, whenever we're leaving, everybody's patting up, I walk around and I just say, shameless plug time, shameless plug time. And I start handing out stickers. Oh, what's yeah. this? A, World War, a, a living history podcast? I never knew this was a thing. Now, my brother asked me, and I think he may be right. Clearly, we're not the first World War II podcast. There's plenty of historical podcasts. But I think the What's the Scuttlebutt is the first living history slash reenacting based podcast. I know there's another one now. There's, uh, there's a group of cats on Instagram who started one. But I think we can stake the claim of being the first reenacting podcast. If I'm wrong, please let us know who's the first is and we'll give them a shout out and check them out. But I think this is the first. That's why, And that's why we call it a World War II based podcast because it's not, you know, we're not just going to sit here and do in depth history lesson. We interview reenactors we talk about the hobby we just talk about the passion of world war ii history and let's be honest most people who dedicate as much of their personal life to world war ii history either a or older now and they stopped reenacting they've had an interest in reenacting they never got into it or are reenactors and so you know let's i'm proud of it we're a reenacting podcast it is what it is and we're one of the first and we're gonna we're gonna claim that man and hold on to it until somebody proves us wrong I love it, yeah. But like you said, let's let's uh, enact with our reenactors. Let's info. Let's I en hear some more stuff. You can, well, let's just make it simple. Mail call. Everybody knows mail call. Mail call at wtspworldwar2.com. Send us your pictures. We'll put it up on our website. Send us your uh, photos. Send us links to your YouTube video. We'll share them. We'll make people see them. Um, yeah, anything. And it, by the way, if you want to come on the podcast, I mean, who better to have on the podcast to talk about history? We can't know everything. And that's the great thing about living history is everybody finds that little niche 
that something that sparks their interest, that lights their fire, and they collect on it, whether it's civilian home front stuff, whether it's first aid stuff, whether it's the field kitchen stuff, like, um, you know, people we've had on the show before. If you have a niche and you think you can carry on a conversation and, you know, hang out with us for 30 minutes or more, hit us up. We want to talk to you. We want to have you on a show. And as well as if you know anybody who is living, they don't have to be a service member. They could be your great grandmother who was alive here on the home front during the war. You know, anybody who is alive in the forties and that's still elusive and can carry on a conversation. We'll make it work. Email us mail call at WTSP world war com, And uh, let's make this thing happen. I'm fired up. I want to get some more shows out to you. We, we kind of slack. Well, we didn't slack off. It's just, between COVID and life and this and that, um, you know, our schedule kind of got mixed up for a while. But we, our commitment to you, the audience, is to start bringing you guys more consistent episodes. So uh, unless you get anything else, Jeff, we're going to do our outro and hit the road. No, sign off. Thank you guys so much for joining us. For Jeff Copsetta, I'm Don Abernathy, and we will talk to you all soon. This has been a Digital 410 production. <laughs>